This is episode 56 of Off Script with Trish Close, intimate interviews and fun conversations with interesting people. In front of my microphone today is Dr. Brian Gross. Hello, Dr. Gross. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Just had a first grandbaby two days ago. I know. I heard the story you were telling me earlier. Um, first grandbaby, this is your daughter who lives in Portland? Uh, well, she lives in McMinnville. Okay. So, um, and mom and baby are doing great. Well, it wasn't quite that simple. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> if, if you want to, tell me the story. Well, um, we got the call on Thursday night and went racing up there about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh-huh. And she kind of wallowed around in minor labor most of the day and went in late at night and had a rough labor and delivered about 7 on Saturday morning. And when we packed up and went on in to see her and hold the baby. And sure. she was looking a little pasty and... Uh, Lots of commotion going on in the room, cleaning up, and I kind of just gently feeling her pulse on her feet, and it was feeble, but the foot was warm, and shortly later, it was cool and not palpable, and Uh they were quite concerned. She'd had quite a bit of bleeding, so she got a helicopter ride to OHSU, thinking she might have to have emergent surgery, but fortunately, it settled down with uh, some transfusions and uh, looked great, and she's very viable and durable and the kid is gorgeous and good they went home today so yay I came home last night well good dad good yeah. thing dad's a cardiologist yeah. <laughs> um so you are in fact a cardiologist i just want to say this is also episode 56 which is me i've been doing this for a year now this okay. podcast so that doesn't mean anything to you and that's okay but i'm quite proud of myself well you should be um so you are also here in your bow tie which is very much Brian Gross. That is me. Okay. Yes, uh, Where did you, have you always worn bow ties? Uh, no, when I was in med school in uh, Rochester, New York, the people that were most impressive to me were on the pediatric service and a mm. pediatric uh, surgeon and, and, an, in, and an actual pediatrician, and both of them wore bow ties. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of, they're happy ties. Uh, they are. They, they are disarming and they're, they're gentle. And uh, people are scared when they come see a doctor, and I think they need to be comfortable. I I need to be comfortable, and they need to be, too. I agree. And why were the uh, pediatric surgeons and doctors impressive to you? What was it about them? Uh, They just... They just could sit there, make great eye contact. They could mm-hmm. sense what was going on with the patient and, and especially the mom and the dad. Yeah. And that's kind of half the battle in pediatrics and right. gain their trust and then gain the trust of the of the kid. Hmm. That's a nice philosophy. You um, semi-retired. Uh, right. You're working at uh, Southern Oregon Cardiology. That's correct. You told me right before we started, you went from 80 to 100 hours a week now down to 40. Yeah, it's something like that. I mean, there were some weeks heavier, and most of them were yeah. about that, maybe sometimes a little lighter. But, you know, if you enjoy your work, um, it's not as much work as you'd think. If you don't Absolutely. enjoy your 40 hours, it's exhausting. But, yes, uh, it is. It's exciting stuff that we do, and it's exhilarating and mm-hmm. stressful, but uh, usually, almost always, not always, but almost always has very happy outcomes and mm-hmm. dramatic effects. Well, we're going to talk a lot about the heart and cardiology and things that you have done specifically here in Southern Oregon. But first of all, where are you from originally? I'm a refugee from New Jersey, <laughs> uh, and born and raised there for the first 18 years of my life. And you know, it was home right outside New York City, mm-hmm. post-World War II town. The only difference was that different color on the house. You know, really? Uh, the, and uh, it was a great place to play a lot of sports and did well in school and always had a girlfriend. I mm-hmm. mean, it was typical, you know. <laughs> Late 50s, early 60s kind of life. Yeah. Okay. Did you grow up with siblings? I have five. Um, oh, my goodness. Well, actually, I have one brother okay. who's two years older than me, and uh, my dad died a month before I was born. Uh, a month he, before you were born? Yeah. Uh, he uh, had been in World War II and was uh, at Rutgers and taken some courses and was stricken with polio. Oh, uh, my goodness. Killed, killed him in a week. Wow, that's yeah, scary. Yeah. So, uh, what did he do in World War II? Oh, he was an electronics officer on a on a destroyer. Okay. And uh, anyway, mom kind of picked up from there. Had wonderful grandparents that kind of raised me for the first mm-hmm. three or four years, and she remarried. And uh, so my stepdad, for all intents and purposes, mm-hmm. was my dad, and had four more half siblings after that. That's that's interesting. Did you ever find that you, um, growing up, wanted to learn more about? Your, your real dad? Yeah, uh, it was, um, there w- you know, there wasn't a lot of this social media or pictures. You know, there were yeah. occasional photographs. It was interesting. Several years ago, my brother resurrected one of those old 8 millimeter films mm-hmm. and stuff and had it put on a videotape. And here I was probably, you know, 60 years of age, and I'm seeing my dad, who I'd never met personally, mm-hmm. 
at about age 25, mm. you know, walking down the street, okay, pushing my brother. Yeah. Okay. It, it was a surreal. I was just going to say thing. surreal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Very he doesn't surreal. look old enough to be my dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, did you ever ask your mom stories? Like, you know, um, you know, I, I, I asked only a few. It mm-hmm. was uh, one of those things that I didn't want to stir up any kind of problem. Sure. I was uncomfortable mm-hmm. doing it and kind of wish I had mm-hmm. at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, she saved a bunch of things that I've got. Uh, nice. Yeah. So, nice. Yeah. Um, so you said childhood and, and your life, you were, you know, you lived in this town since you were 18. Right. right. So just tip, very normal. Yeah. I mean, a lot of sports and just a good place. It was, uh, you know, they always provided. We, we were kind of uh, weren't wealthy by any stretch. It was, you know, kind of lower middle class, but had every never wanted for a lack of a meal. Right. Got to go camping, had right. bikes we'd take off. And, you know, it was free range, uh, ranging kid development. I mean, you just got on a bike, you had to be home for dinner. Yeah. And you'd go 20, 30 miles sometimes, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and you really don't know any better if you if you grow up and you don't have a whole lot, you don't know the difference, yeah, really. I, I, you know, we, we traveled to the Adirondacks to, to go camping, and, and that was, you know, pretty much it. Everything nice. you wanted was around town. There was always dinner. We'd have homemade pizza once a month. And, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now you're was, talking. Yeah. So it was. It what was, did your stepdad do? He was, uh, he was a jack of all trades, and it was a, kind of an interesting guy. He, he grew up in Holland, lived with nine siblings in a two bedroom apartment. <gasps> And kind of came over in the late 1930s when the winds of war mm-hmm. were developing. Mm-hmm. The, his his dad had come over to work sweeping floors in a uh, in Bayonne, New Jersey, in some factory, and they came over Rikers Island, and uh, you know, just basically barely survived. Wow! Uh, it was uh, they were. And, and, you know, I think probably in that kind of a setting, never had the, the lovey-dovey kind of relationship, hugging like, mm-hmm. you know, you want your kids to have now. And, I, I, you know, he, he was incredibly driven, never watched TV, read constantly. There wasn't anything he couldn't do, so he kind of put himself through, through college. And he, if the car got totaled, he would fix it in the garage hmm. on his own. He would figure out a way to bend the frame. He'd build a, a dormer on the house as our family grew. Um, not very, you know, he basically he was n- not very pleased that I liked to play sports. It was get a job, get a trade. Because really? he came from a, sure. you know, you need to put food on the table. Yeah. That, that was the atmosphere that was the philosophy then yeah for sure so i had a little bit easier because my older brother basically fought those battles and it was easier for (laughs) you it was a little bit easier for me yes awesome (laughs) so after high school at this point do you know you want to be a doctor you know you want to go into medicine oh at that point it wasn't very high on my list i would pass out if i got a shot (laughs) i still do i'm extraordinarily brave on my end of the needle but when you come at me with a flu shot, I have to lie down. And, oh, my. Uh, that's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. No, I, um, I wasn't sure. It was, you know, during the era of the Vietnam War. Um, mm-hmm. But back then, as a high school kid, you didn't pay much attention to it. Um, didn't watch the news at night. And my high school, one of my high school coaches had said, Brian, you know, nobody in our high school has ever gone to a service academy. I'll go, coach. Yeah. I mean, that's how much thought I put into it. Really? And so never even made it to my high school graduation because I had to fly out. I got accepted at the Air Force Academy, and I played soccer for them. Um, and I got out there, and whoa, <laughs> this isn't kind of what I was expecting. <laughs> I mean. I bet. I bet. And, and so I transferred then to where my brother was, and he was at Wesleyan University. So here I was at probably one of the most conservative institutions in the entire world, And overnight, I found myself at Wesleyan University, one of the little three Ivy League colleges where there was all sorts of rampant anti-war stuff, and my head was spinning. I bet. Culture shock. It was a huge culture shock. uh, But I had some good friends there and worked hard and uh, did a uh, partway through a master's. I played soccer um, uh, and ran track there and uh, did pretty well in those sports. And uh, actually, it was interesting. uh, uh, I, I had a year off uh, from playing. When you, when you transfer from one college to another, you, you, you lose a year of eligibility. Oh. And uh, so I, I you know, young and muscular, I had to go do things. I played a lot of squash. I'd never played squash before. Interesting. It got me into medical school. Squash. Yeah. Squash uh, got you into medical school. So it was a very competitive time. When I left the academy, I was in the Air Force Reserve. 
Um, and a lot of people were trying to get out of Vietnam, and one of the only um, uh, deferments mm -hmm. was to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. So I was already in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I, it was heavy competition. I didn't get in my first year. I did a, ma a part of a master's program. I got in my second year, but in my one interview that I had at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, I met with a fellow who was a, a, a biophysicist, a radiation expert. I had no clue what that was. <laughs> um, but he was a fanatical squash player. And when he heard that I played, mm -hmm. we spent an hour at the squash courts just talking squash. And that probably made all the difference, separated me from yeah. any one of a number other. And and I, I did pretty well in med school. I loved it. It was just uh, just endless like uh, they often say uh, just you're drinking from a fire hydrant there is so much oh, information sure. that you get but you had a great study group i had great friends and i just uh, uh i just loved it what did you love about it um was it the knowledge was it just oh everything? just every day you learn something and then mm. you know you'd read it in a book but then you'd see it in a person and it was absolutely phenomenal and then there were beginning to emerge some treatments there, there weren't a whole lot of treatments mm -hmm. in the early 70s mm -hmm. there really weren't um uh, you know there may be three or four antihypertensive drugs uh, but now you've got hundreds of them uh, but it was just in a in a major growth spurt and yeah every day was just a challenge it was terrifying when you'd you'd go from being finally getting comfortable after six weeks on a pediatric floor they'd put you on a ob floor or a surgical floor and you know first day jitters all the nurses knew 20 times much as yeah, you, and, as you. <laughs> and you know you didn't try to be too obsequious but my gosh what am I going how am I going to learn this but you, you'd learn quick and uh, you had good mentors mm -hmm. and uh, I just got I couldn't decide I loved every aspect I couldn't decide what I wanted to go into so I said I'll stay in medicine that seemed to give me more options and from there, I got uh, matched at Dartmouth, where I did my internship and mm -hmm. residency, and I was uh, lucky enough. I was uh, the intern of the year, and I was the resident of the year two years in a row out of about 30 people, and uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. And then at the end of that, I, I, I couldn't decide. Did I want to do just internal medicine, or did I want to go on and do pulmonary or nephrology? I happened to be on cardiology at the time when I had to make the next decision in my life, and... Um, uh, the guy who was head of cardiology said, I know this guy who's head of cardiology in Seattle at the University of Washington. I said, wow, that'd be fun to go there. It's a long <laughs> way away. I'd never been mm -hmm. out there. And he says, I'll get you, I'll make some phone calls. And I got accepted to this very, uh, very competitive program and was overwhelmed with mm -hmm. initially with what they were doing compared to what we were doing. And, but settled in, it was a two-year fellowship and just about the ten, and I got actually involved in some really exciting stuff. It was um, the early days of electrophysiology. Okay. Um, where uh, my job uh, was to basically kill people. <laughs> and it, it sounds crude, but that we had, you may have heard of Seattle has Met Medic One, which is, you know, one of the, the most enviable, most uh, uh, incredible uh, paramedic units. Okay. And, uh, uh, if you try to drop dead on the streets of Seattle with an electrical heart attack, um, you'd be resuscitated about a third of the time, which was incredible because most of the time you don't make it. When your heart suddenly stops, you've got right. five or ten minutes to get a rhythm back. And they've positioned the city uh, with, with paramedic units and defibrillators and, and people know CPR. And so we had a fair number of people uh, come to us who had literally died and been resuscitated, but those people were at an extraordinarily high risk. Maybe 30 to 50 percent of them would just suddenly die again without any warning. Oh my goodness. And this was before we had these implantable defibrillators. Right. The only thing we had were a few drugs uh, that were called antiarrhythmics, which are designed to settle down the irritable electrical heart. And uh, so I happened to join the faculty right at a time when a fellow came out from Johns Hopkins. They were just beginning to start an electrical program. They needed a fellow, so that was that my was job. You. I remember the first week we built a heart cath table with a bunch of with some plywood and a bunch of two by fours, and we resurrected an old small portable C arm unit, and that was our X ray machine. And I would put catheters up into the heart, and we would deliver small little electrical pulses. Um, uh, like a pacemaker, patient doesn't feel that, and you would put in a series of fast ones, and you would intentionally try to short-circuit the heart and put them into a fatal heart rhythm. That was the goal. 
Wow. Because we only had medicines. And then you would say, okay, I can cause it. Now I would load them up with a medicine, watch them for two or three weeks in the hospital. Is this a drug that you could take mm -hmm. for the rest of your life? Well, if they got diarrhea or a rash and they said, I can't, I feel miserable, we'd stop it, start another drug. And if they tolerated it, I'd take them to the, the lab and I would put the catheters back up in there and pace them and I would try to short circuit. I could not short circuit your heart or my heart. I can only short circuit with the protocol people who had a vulnerable, electrically fragile heart. Wow. And literally, it would almost always put them into a fatal heart rhythm. That's not the drug they went home on. And it would take three or four tries before as hard as I tried, I could not short circuit their heart. And it was white knuckle, terrifying, <laughs> oh exhilarating intention. I, I, mean, I never lost a single person, but boy, I'll tell you, I mean, it was my, the doc and me, and we'd had two nurses there, and you'd put somebody into a fatal heart rhythm, and you know, you did that, you got to get them out of it. And mm. of course, they drift right out of consciousness, so they don't feel or right. hear anything. Um, it although, sounds like the movie Flatliners. Well, it's what is. I mean, you basically, first thing that happens is the heart, which is going along, when you put them into a fatal heart rhythm, it quivers, and within five or ten seconds, they drift off. It's painless. They don't feel a thing. Okay. But if you shock them too quickly, they will feel it because, yes, they may not be able to move their eyes, mm -hmm. but they can still feel and they can still hear. Okay. And, uh, and this was designed for... For what? For drugs? For this, for drugs at that time, because gotcha. that was all we had. However, at about the same time, we were beginning to develop these implantable pacemakers, which mm -hmm. are called defibrillators. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, we occasionally will use drugs to try and suppress a lot of background irritable rhythms. But most of the time, we put the defibrillator in these patients who have survived an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And... Uh, if they go into a fatal heart rhythm, the first thing it does is it tries to pace them really fast out of it. And if that doesn't work, it waits 10 seconds. It shocks them. And before you could even call 911, because it takes mm -hmm. a while mm -hmm. for the paramedics to get there. Yeah, a, a few minutes, um, if, if you're lucky, and depending right. on where you live, right? right. Exactly. Uh, right. So was this part of like a trial, a study that oh, you yeah. did? Yeah, this was, was all trial stuff and okay. de developing while well, we had experimental medications and, and we were then developing defibrillators. And okay, stuff, yeah. was this part of the, the Gusto trials or was that something different? Well, that's, that's a little different. That's okay. after I got here. So there's two kinds of heart attacks that you can think of. Uh, the one that the Gusto was part of and uh, the one that we've published some articles about are the more common ones. Those are the plumbing. The plumbing heart attacks are when they, these fuel lines that are you know, half the size of an eraser and there's three major branches and a bunch of side branches. When they block off, that's the one that you see on TV where they grip and they get okay. they sweat and they get short of breath. And about 10% of them, when they block off an artery, will go into a fatal rhythm. Okay, where the heart just suddenly short circuits. But that's so there's plumbing heart attacks and electrical heart attacks. So originally I was doing electrical heart right. attacks. And then when I got here, I actually was doing some initial electrical heart attack work. But that field was growing so quickly. And simultaneously, the plumbing started to come in with balloons and stents. And I got intrigued by that. And, I, mm -hmm. and we had a couple other people that subsequently joined us uh, in, the, in the valley that were still a couple years beyond me in training and I let them do the electrical stuff and I went in and did more okay. of the plumbing stuff. So let's back up a little bit. You're in Seattle doing all of this right. amazing work, white knuckle work. Yeah, it really was. When yeah. did you, did you make the move from Seattle to Southern Oregon? Oh, well, it's a, yeah. So what happened was it was a two year fellowship at that time. Now it's three or four years, depending on what you do. Um, cause there's a whole lot more things you have to know and yeah. techniques you have to master. Uh, and I met my wife who happened to be the, the head charge nurse at the Harborview Medical Center. Okay. Um, and I thought, wow, this, 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 she's a neat lady and this, this might work out. And I had two contracts in my pocket. I had one from Missoula, Montana and one from Wenatchee, Washington mm -hmm. to, to, to be, to go on staff there. And I said, ah, I think I'll... I'll just uh, I'll, I'll just put it on hold for a year. Okay. And uh, so they gave me an assistant professorship, and I kind of worked part in the emergency room at Harborview and part in cardiology. And uh, things worked out with my wife. We got married, and uh, and I still was couldn't decide where I wanted to go. And um, one of my former mentors there said, I have a best friend who's in Medford. His name's John Forsyth. I said, where's Medford? <laughs> I had never heard of Medford. That makes two of us. Okay. And uh, 
So I said, I just out of basically out of out of deference to him, just so I didn't. You know, I said, I'll go fly down there and take a look. And I okay. flew in one night. And what, was, what year was this? This was 1982. Okay. I flew down. I didn't even bring my future wife because I said I'm just going to do that. And before I left the airport at night, I had met John Forsyth, who greeted me there. And I said, this is the fellow that I want to practice medicine with. Mm. And he took me over to Providence Hospital that night, and I, I met Earl Sharoman, who was an emergency room doc, phenomenal fella. And about 10 o'clock at night, I met this guy named Al Bates, who was walking down the hall, having just sat with a woman who was terrified about having gallbladder surgery the following morning, and he had come in to sit with her. And I met those three guys, and I said, wow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is where I want to practice. And the next day, I went over. It was the Medford Clinic at that point, and I met Bruce Van Zee and John Brandenburg and Tom Galati, and just uh, and so they took they took me out to dinner to the Jacksonville Inn, and uh, kind of at a recruitment thing. And Tom Galati, I don't know if you know Tom. But, I don't. But he's just a phenomenal. He's an endocrinologist and internist, and just a full of life guy. I mean, to be around him. It's like a Labrador retriever. You just, it's just exciting to be there. And he's into river rafting and stuff. And, and so he sottles up next to me at the Jacksonville Inn for having dinner and says, do you hunt? And when I said no, he said, good, you're hired because we need somebody to cover the service while we go Wait, duck hunting in October. When, go hunt, when they go hunting, they need <laughs> so someone that here who does That was all his it. criteria. Well. I love it. Um, Alan Bates, former state senator. Yes. yes. Um, I've interviewed him. I, I, dozens of times yeah. one of the most genuinely he nice was, guys he was the real deal too. he really was he was uh, like john forsyth i mean just totally interested in making sure that medical care was equitable for everybody and and the, his bedside manner i mean just everything about about dr bates was pretty absolutely. fantastic absolutely yeah i know a lot of people miss him for sure yeah. um so you fly into this beautiful place you meet yeah. all these great guys and were you instantly thinking, this is it? This yes, is where we went? Absolutely. I okay. went home and I told Nancy, I said, this is where we need to go. And she had been reading some of the literature about the rafting and the hiking and the mm -hmm. skiing and and uh, the Shakespeare. And she says, oh, I want to see it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you guys move. We came down here in uh, late May of uh, 1982 and uh, I joined the, an 18 person group at the Medford Clinic and we had some surgeons and obstetricians and pediatricians and internists. And mm -hmm. at that point, I was an internist first and a cardiologist second. There wasn't mm -hmm. a lot of stuff you did cardiology. And there were four other cardiologists in town who were um, part of the, what they call the, cardi uh, the cardiology consultant group. And, and they were some of my closest friends. They were very welcoming. Here I was, kind of a competition. And Rick Schaefer and Minor Matthews and Mark Moran and Nick Dienel, I mean, they welcomed me. Mm. Um, I still had to do my own coverage. Of course. I was on every night, every weekend for cardiology. Of course. <laughs> but, but when my babies were born, they covered me for the day. Nice. And, and that was good. Yeah. And, and we rafted rivers together and mm. have done lots of things and have kept those relationships up. So was Rogue Regional Medical Center here when you were here? It was uh, Rogue Valley Hospital. Rogue Valley Hospital. And then it became Rogue Regional Medical Center. And then it became Asante Rogue Regional yeah, Medical I, Center. Oh, Shoot, I permutations. Know. I know. <laughs> I know. So, and it's grown. I mean, well, this whole valley, oh. I mean, you've seen probably oh, thousands I, of changes. Uh, you know, I, I, lo I love to give lectures. I've probably given 500 lectures. Wow. Uh, um, and... Uh, I keep all of them on my PowerPoint and stuff. And I, one of my favorite ones is when I, when I talk at the manor, I talk to the lay public. I show the picture of 1955 of Rogue, Regional Med Rogue Valley Medical Center. It was basically this, you know, box structure. Absolutely no other building, just pheasant fields on either side of it out there. And now I, I show all of the, you know, the latest you know, drone view of the place with parking garages and yeah. and everything. And, and then I say, we know we have really arrived because then I have whirling in a Starbucks. 
<laughs> so we know we've we're in. Yep. Yes, it, <laughs> it's the place to be. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the is it the STEMI? The STEMI program. Yes. yes. So that's the plumbing heart attack. It's yes. Okay. S- this is what we're talking about. ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. So. When I was in training in the 70s and even in the early uh, 80s when I was in my cardiology fellowship, basically when someone came in with a plumbing heart attack, the bad chest discomfort, sweating, shortness of breath, down the arm, that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff, the mortality rate was 25%. One out of every four people never left the hospital. Wow. That is astoundingly high yes okay i mean it was you know uh, like being given the kiss of death you you know you talk outside the room and Mm -hmm. all that stuff and you know uh, anyway um about that time we began to develop new strategies in fact um uh when i was still in seattle uh, one of my one of my mentors the head of cardiology ward kennedy a giant in the field um basically took some information from other studies, and we did the very first attempts to open an artery in the middle of a heart attack. Um, They didn't know what caused a heart attack until the late 1970s, early 1980s, when they started catheterizing people in the middle of a chest pain episode. And they found that if you had ST elevation on the EKG, a kind of an elevation of one portion of it, that translated to an artery was completely blocked. And Mm -hmm. all the other strategies up until then were trying to save a little muscle on the fringe. So once we had that, we had to figure out how are you going to open that artery? And there was this medicine that had been around in the 50s and then abandoned called streptokinase. And he resurrected it, mm-hmm. and we would go into the lab, and we, in the middle of the heart attack, we would put a catheter in the artery that was blocked, and we would drip in over an hour and a half, just a little bit every, every minute. And it would percolate down there and try and dissolve the clot. And we proved that you could open the artery, and you could lower the mortality. Okay. And it was, it was phenomenal. Um, about the same time, they started to develop uh, new technologies with wires and balloons to put them down there. But the initial, don't ever, ever, ever try to do it in a heart attack. And then after about 10 years, they said, well, maybe you can do it. And it seemed to work. Um, and then the Gusto trial, which was in the early 1990s, um, they, they took 41,000 patients that they know ahead of time what, how many patients they need to prove that one drug is better than another. So mm-hmm. we had this streptokinase that initially we had to only be able to give to a catheter uh, in the cath lab. And that's a no-starter unless you're doing research yeah. because nobody's going to be doing that in the real. So okay. you had to make it intravenously, and we developed protocols where you could give it intravenously. Now every emergency room, theoretically, if you had the guts, could give it. Now you got to be careful because the side effect is bleeding. Oh. It doesn't dissolve all, it dissolves all clots, good clots and bad clots. So you got to pick your patients carefully. Gotcha. Um, but then the start of the biomedical revolution started where they were, uh, the Silicon Valley, developing all these new drugs with antibodies and mm-hmm. capabilities. And a drug came out called TPA, Tissue Plasminogen Activator. And there was a huge investment that this new magical drug, which cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars as opposed to streptokinase, a couple hundred, they wanted to see it work. Well, they calculated it would take 41,000 people given either streptokinase or the TPA to prove that there was a 1% survival advantage at 30 days. Wow. But it was better. Okay. It was better. And what do you want? I want the best drug if I'm on the table. Please. (laughs) And it's gotten better since then. They've refined that drug into several others. But it's still, it only worked about 50 to 60% of the time. So in your middle of a heart attack with no blood pressure and you're sweating, you give this drug and about half the time it would open and the other half it wouldn't. And um, so we were trying to make a better mousetrap. And so those of us who were doing balloons and stents started noticing if we happened to be on when a heart attack patient came in, we, and the cath lab was there, we could take them in and we could kind of hasten the opening. Rather than giving the blood clot dissolving medicine, we'd put a balloon with a stent across it. And, whoa, they seemed to get better quicker. But mm-hmm. it wasn't only a couple of us were doing balloon stents. The rest of the cardiologists were doing lots of other things. And coordinating all these activities was um, not necessarily, uh, it, it didn't always line up. There was no specific system. So that's okay. what kind of started our STEMI program. We decided, the whole group of, there were actually two cardiology groups, the ones I was talking about, and my mm-hmm. group called the Heart Clinic, 
and we met every Wednesday. We had a, a real collaborative meeting where we would talk about challenging cases, and we were um, treating people with heart attacks from all over the state of Jefferson. And many of them weren't getting treated quick enough, or even if they were getting treated quick enough, it wasn't opening the artery, and there was lots of damage. Mm -hmm. Time is muscle. You don't open that artery, more and more muscle dies, and then your V8 engine becomes a, a V5 or a V4, and okay. you're left with that. And we decided that we would step up to the plate and this was probably the first place in the country or, or maybe one of two places in the country where we said we will rearrange our schedules, we'll work together, that when I'm on as an interventional doctor, I will be with the, uh, uh, they'll make sure that somebody in the other group who isn't an interventionalist is on, and then when their interventionalist is on, they'll be with one of my partners who's not an interventional doctor with Belinda. And that way you're not on every other night. Right. You're on every fourth, maybe. And uh, we made a promise uh, to the community that we would take every patient with the acute STEMI on the I-5 corridor in Josephine, Jackson County, and Northern Siskiyou, day or night, we, in, we taught the paramedics how to read the EKGs, and they were allowed to wake us up at 2 o'clock in the morning and commit heresy. At that time, in 2003, mm -hmm. when you had a heart attack, the dogma was you always went to the closest hospital. Right. Not anymore. No. We told them, you make the diagnosis of an acute heart attack with the EKG computer printout and your clinical impression. And then you're coming down I-5 while the cath lab crew and the interventional doc are going to our cath lab. And boom, we meet you right there. Because what normally would happen up to that point was if you're up in Josephine County, you'd get scooped, brought into the Three Rivers Hospital. Mm-hmm where they would give you the blood clot dissolving medicine that may or may not work, and after two or three hours and you're still having pain and hemodynamic problems, they'd call the cardiologist and say, I think we need your help. All right, send them down. They'd come down the emergency room. We'd look at them. If they were still having pain, we'd call in the cath lab team and try to rouse them up to come on in and mm -hmm. get enough people to do it, and hours and hours and hours would pass. Whereas now, 30-minute drive and simultaneous right into the cath lab, 15 yeah. minutes after arrival, we've got the artery open. And we did, it just seemed to make sense. Patients seemed to get better quicker. So we, were started to, we followed all those. The first year, we did 233 consecutive, every last STEMI in the state of Jefferson on the I-5 corridor. Every one of them always came to us eventually. Okay. Okay. They, always, they, they didn't stay at these other smaller hospitals. They would get sent to us, but always after the fact. And then we would study them electively and send them to surgery or put them on medicine. So they came emergently. And uh, out of the 233 patients, the total death rate for all of them was 2.1%. We were a top 100 hospital for five out of seven years. Out of the 5,000 hospitals, we were always a top 100 by whatever combination of therapies we did. The death rate for us was about 8.5% prior to 2003, and for the rest of the country, it was 12.5% on average. For the 233 consecutive patients, it was 2.1%. If you walked into a hospital like uh, Ashland or Three Rivers or Fairchild, well, it took about half an hour to an hour to get you out of there and get you up to us, the death rate was twice the two point was 4.2 percent, but half of what it was right. if you walked into our hospital prior to that. If you walked into Rogue Valley, because we could get you to the lab so quickly, I think we had 33 patients, zero died. But the most impressive thing, the thing that I think I'm most proud of the program that showed, was that if you called 911, and permitted the paramedics to use the protocols that Dr. Mm -hmm. Rostigus and I and the cardiologists developed. There were 81 patients who called 911 in that year and a half. Not a single patient died. They all survived the hospitalization. That's is, amazing. That's an astounding. And we didn't realize what we had. I mean, we didn't, at this point, this was 2004. We didn't publish it. We just, this is the way we're going to do business. And, but I got more and more interested in it. I go to the major meetings. And I found there was this fellow from Minnesota who was think, dabbling in doing the same kind of stuff with the Minnesota Heart Institute. And we got to talk in a bit. And we were, they, people heard about us. And in 2007, there was a big meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. at a place called the Heart House, which is they brought 
uh, all the major players from the Mayo Clinic and Cleveland mm-hmm. Clinic and UCLA and Johns Hopkins. And, uh, you know, they were getting inklings that when people did balloons and stents for heart attacks, they seemed to do better. But there were no organized programs. that they, they weren't doing right. it universally on every patient. Right. And the opening line at this conference in 2000, May of 2007 was, we're here today to change the way we treat heart attacks in the United States. We need to do it the way they're doing it in Southern Oregon. No way. That was the opening line of this conference. How cool. We had just published an article um, about three weeks before that hit the American Journal of Cardiology. And, you know. Did that make some, your chest pop it, up it a little bit? It still gives me a little goosebumps when, I, when awesome. I hear that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, oh, this is Medford. Come on. Those guys, what are they? they you can't do that. Yeah. And so two years later, a bunch of places obviously knew that it had the potential. The issue was trying to pull together all of the paramedics and the hospitals. I mean, uh, uh, administrators of other hospitals don't want their patients to go somewhere else. Sure. So you can understand that. Sure. And, and the, you want the personal pride of taking care of it. And, and, the, and the rules were for the paramedics, you go to the closest hospital. Now they're taking a risk. They had mm-hmm. to trust us, and they did mm-hmm. trust us, mm-hmm. and we gave them great feedback, and uh, it basically changed medicine. And so there were about 10 hospitals then, major centers at a UCLA and Duke, who started copying that. And we published an article in 2009, which was uh, just say, this can be done in huge cities, medium-sized cities, and smaller urban areas like ours. Yeah. It is now the standard of care. You figure it out how you're going to supply this service to your patients mm-hmm. that you, you're sworn to serve. Okay, and every, you know, depending on how many people, you, you'll have to make decisions whether you transfer or whether you hire people to do it. But this is the new strategy for treating heart attacks. And if you go back to the 1970s, I said the death rate was 25%. Right. They developed coronary care units in the 70s and early 80s, so at least you had a nurse there. Very few medicines, but they could shock you if you suddenly had a short-circuiting rhythm. The death rate dropped to about 15%. With the blood clot dissolving medicines still being used in some places, mm-hmm. like you can't get here from the coast or Lakeview quick enough, so we give the blood clot the medicine in the emergency room there, and then we chopper them over here right. to, to uh, get it open the rest of the way. Yes, um, so the death rate for that, for the blood clot dissolving, is anywhere from oh, 6 to 12%, depending on how quickly and effectively they give it. But now universally around the country, the death rate is in the 3 to 4% range, which is it's 25% to 3 to exactly. 4 in, in just one career. Right. And, and it's, a, it's an amazing. And now they're, they're using a lot of those same strategies for strokes. Where you're blocking, okay. the, where they will initially gave the blood clot dissolving medicine, and now they're going up with special catheters to kind of pull the clot out of the head. When this, when you all, when you look at this in kind of the whole form here, this is a group of cardiologists. That's correct, and paramedics, yes. and cath lab staff, and ER docs. Right, yeah. but in the very beginning of all of this, <coughs> this was a, a bunch, a group of doctors saying, let's try and see, first of all, if this works right. and let's make this commitment, like you said, to the community yeah. and you saved lives. Yeah. I, think I mean, I know did. that's your and job. It's, it's <laughs> exhilarating. Though. I mean, well, the, the beauty of, of the balloon stent is when you're in the middle of a heart attack, the vast majority of people, I mean, they're in there, they're, you see the pictures on TV. It can't, yeah. you know, sometimes it embellishes a little bit, <laughs> but they're hurting. They're having 10 over 10 or 8 over 10 chest discomfort, and they're short of breath, and their blood pressure is low. And literally, I mean, it's just like you see on TV. I mean, you meet them at the ambulance bay, you unload them, and you're jogging down the hall, and the paramedic is giving you the report of what they were able to glean from a family member, which, you know, they're scared to death. They're not getting much information. And you're trying to do a physical exam as quick as you can and get up the artery and the wrist or the arm and get the artery open as quick as you can. And it, it, the best analogy I can make, if I put a blood pressure cuff up on your arm and I blow it up we, and we check your blood pressure, it's no big deal. Mm-hmm. But if I left it up for 10 minutes, how do you feel? You become an unhappy. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and if I left it up for an hour or two, which is about the amount of time before somebody calls for help, okay, your, your hand's blue. What's going to happen if I leave that blood pressure cuff up overnight? What's your arm going to look like the next day? Um, not It'll good. Be It'll yeah. be dead. Well, Yikes. Yeah. Will you die? Not necessarily, but... You might, 10% might die from a gangrene as the arm falls off and stuff right. like that. But, but you'd be the one, one-armed TV announcer and stuff, you know. <laughs> um, and so when you get that balloon, you, you, you basically what you're doing is you're threading a needle. 
Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, the needle's moving. Okay, and oh yeah, it's completely blocked, and you got to find your way through the through the hole in in, mm-hmm. in the, and but you get real good at it. It's a skill, and, it, and we can get about ninety five percent of them open. And when you blow up that balloon, and the blood goes roaring down in there, oh, oh I mean, relief. Little, it's relief. It's like when I release release the blood yeah. pressure cuff. You just feel life coming back into it. Mm, um, all it, tingly. It, it, yeah, it's exciting. I mean, it re- that it's is exciting. exhilarating. And and they go home. In two days now. That's incredible. As opposed to when I was in, in med school, it was a three-week hospitalization. Wow. When Eisenhower had his heart attack in the mid-1950s, it was, you know, three weeks in the hospital and three months of complete and total bed, bed rest. rest. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's incredible to think about. Um, and, you know, during this time, I think it was, we were talking about it. My husband's a paramedic. Oh, okay. Uh, and with Medford Fire Department. Yep. So he knows all about you. He knows all about this program. Um, We've talked about it several times, and it's just like, if you're going to have a heart attack anywhere in the country, you need to have it in the Rogue Valley. Medford and Rogue Valley, the whole area here, it's pretty much the, um, you know, I I, I have one of these cases that I love to show of a a 51-year-old fella who was a river guide up in Grants Pass, and he was having breakfast one morning with his wife, and this wasn't heartburn, Mm -hmm. and she drove him right to the emergency room. 23 minutes after he arrived, he was in an ambulance, and 25 minutes after that, he was in the cath lab, and 12 minutes after that, I had his artery open, and he goes home in two days. That's fantastic. And, he, and he's got, you know, his V8 engine's a V7 and a half. <laughs> he's got plenty of engine power. We're exactly. We're turning to doing what, what, what he needs to do. And, and the offshoot of that, it's been so successful. It's now the standard of care. I mean, it wasn't just us. It was a compilation of our ability to pull together administrators from all the hospital, administrators and paramedics from all the different mm-hmm. 10 services and fire departments mm-hmm. willing to do this, buy-in from the two hospital cardiology groups and the emergency rooms to work with us, and everybody was willing to do it. Amazing. And it worked. Mm-hmm. And and now it's spread to, that's the plumbing heart attack, and you may have heard of this pulse point that we have yes. active. Yes. So that's the electrical heart attack, where somebody who has had a previous heart muscle damage or a dilated heart or leaky valves or bad, has a damaged heart. And those hearts, these are the ones that I worked on in 1982 up at University of Washington, just suddenly, without warning, you go into a fatal rhythm. And unless Mm -hmm. you reestablish a normal rhythm within about 10 minutes, it's about a 1% mortality uh, of 10% mortality per minute. So after 10 minutes, you're pretty much gone. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have, uh, obviously, paramedics do probably the best CPR of anybody, even better than cardiologists by far. Yeah. This is what they practice. This is what Every they day. train. <laughs> okay. And, um, uh, but, you know, if you're out here in Ross and Lee Lane, uh, the, where's the closest fire department? And if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, yeah. it takes X number of minutes to mm-hmm. get here. So this pulse point is a way to utilize uh, social media mm-hmm. and uh, uh, get active participants. There's, you know, healthcare is the biggest industry in this valley right yeah. now. I think there's a lot of nurses and therapists and doctors, and we, you know, they know how to do basic life support. And the good news is you don't have to do mouth to mouth anymore. No, I mean it's a messy business when people have a cardiac arrest and right. they're gurgling. And I often have this slide when I teach ACLS courses of Michael Manson. And I said, if Michael Manson goes down, I'm not doing CPR on him. I mean, you know, he just doesn't look like somebody I want to do mouth to mouth on. Yeah, no kidding. But you don't need to when you think about it. Just chest compressions. Because you're pushing air out, and when you let go, it mm-hmm. sucks air in. And um, this system will, if you're within 400 yards of a person who collapses, and of course, everybody has a cell phone now, everybody. they call 911. And the algorithm that the, the uh, uh, person on the other end of the line, this sounds like it could be a cardiac arrest. could be a seizure, but it sounds like a cardiac arrest. They call the closest paramedic unit. Do you know CPR? Start it. Mm-hmm. And it also, we've mapped where all of the AEDs are. And there's thousands, several. Yeah, two, there's th- one two, downstairs. There's 2,000 AEDs in Jackson County. They're all mapped on the phone. So if you're within 400 yards and you said, I'm willing to do it with this free app called Pulse Point, this thing will have an obnoxious blare. You go, what's that? And you look at it and say, CPR needed. Up comes the Google map, and it shows where you are. It shows where the patient is, and it shows where all the closest AEDs are. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of response can work because you know where the safest place to have an electrical heart attack is in the, in, in the world? Where's that? 
it, not even in my cath lab. <laughs> it's in a casino. Oh, yeah. Lots because of people. and They're watching everybody, okay? They've got their eyes on everybody looking for cheaters, right? And as soon as somebody goes down, they're watching, is this a diversion? But those security guards know how to do CPR, and they've got an AED. They will get shocked within one to two minutes wow. of collapsing. As opposed to mm -hmm. here, it's going mm -hmm. to take a couple minutes. It's going to take several five, ten minutes. Yeah. And remember, ten percent mortality per minute. Good to know. So, so the pulse point's been kind of exciting. And I bet. Yeah, lots had, of exciting things. Yeah. So it's um, and then then there's you know the rest of cardiology, which is also very very exciting. I mean, you, know, you get people who are short of breath from congestive heart failure, or dizzy, or passing out, or high blood pressure or low blood pressure. We've got so many different therapies nowadays mm -hmm. and we've got, uh, great rehab units. And it's a, it's, a, it's a fun place to go to work. I can see the passion on yeah. your face. Yeah. You absolutely love it. Yeah. Well, you know, on behalf of the community, I mean, just thanks for your, your service, well, your, well, your work. Well, well it's, it's, it's a whole team of nurses and paramedics and administrators. Sure. And, um, you know, no one person ever does this alone. I had a lot of fun because I got to administrate this particular program yeah. and give a, I love giving lectures on it. It's prideful. But it's, it's an entire group of people. It's a community that makes this really, thing work. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, we're going to wrap up just a little bit. Okay. But now that you're just working 40 hours a week, yeah. um, what are you doing in your semi-retirement? Um, well, I play uh, a little bit of golf once or twice a a week with one of the other cardiologists, the first cardiologist in town, Dr. Minor Matthews, and mm -hmm. Bruce Van Zee, who's one of my heroes. Um, and um, I, I, I do a little salmon and steelhead fishing a couple times a year. Um, and um, now I've got a grandchild up I in know. McMinnville. And I've got four kids that who are scattered. Uh, they're all in healthcare kinds of. Uh, really? You got a, an older, uh, my oldest son is down in San Francisco. He's. Um, a doc and he's into heavy social media he does this thing called doximity which is a linkedin for physicians he founded the company and does some aligning venture capitalists with uh, social media medical things that need need to get started and he's had a lot of success with that and a daughter who is a, runs a physical therapy office in mcminnville uh, now with the baby and then i have twins a boy girl twins Aww. and uh the the boy went to Yale and uh, he was one of those skull and serpent, you know, really <laughs> smart guys. And, yeah. And uh, he is actually one of the two other him and two other co-founders are doing this very exciting project where they're going to hopefully solve the or at least contribute to an improvement in the expenditure for um, some of the sickest people, the mm. ones who are really, you know the something like 10 to 20 percent of people are responsible for 80 percent of the costs mm. and they're doing this po uh, project in 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 brooklyn and he went through google and then alphabet which is the parent company and developed this new program which is funded by them where they're they're actually delivering health care on that what they hope will be a much more efficient uh platform uh, and and reduce costs and an awful lot of insurance companies are watching closely okay and then the twin sister is in Boston, and she's with a, a company, a, a startup that is looking at imaging lesions. You know, if you have a lesion, it takes a long time to get in to see a dermatologist, like six months. And if you've yes. got a bad cancer, like a melanoma, you need to get in right away. Yes. And uh, they've got these machines, which are three-dimensional, and they've developed them, and uh, they can uh, – um, they – they have a panel of dermatologists who are reading it right now, but it's kind of artificial intelligence. You know, the dermatologist sees 2,000 of these. The machine sees 500,000, and they're able to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Is it low or high probability? If it's high probability, they get right in. So it's exciting Amazing. stuff. Exciting stuff for your, her. Your kiddos are changing the world. Well, that, that you know, they, they are, they are well-grounded and having fun doing it. And having mm -hmm. a, I just wish they were closer because I don't like to travel. Yeah. I'm, very comfortable here in the road valley that's what you said to me on the phone you said you were very excited to get home you know i drove down i-5 last night my my daughter was just fine my wife's going to stay up there and help them for uh, a couple days because she was so anemic after the birth but uh, it's so gorgeous driving down here and you come into the valley and you see mount mclaughlin and everything is so green and um i i just love this place and uh, 
I don't like to travel. <laughs> I'd rather just sit out there on the on my porch and read the New England Journal of Medicine. Mm-hmm. It's, I'm with you. I mean, when I, I like to travel to see family, but I'm just not, I don't have the bug that a lot yeah. of people have. Yeah, I have no I have no desire to go to Europe or Greece or any of that stuff. I can look it up on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to wrap up. Okay. Um, I do think it's pretty awesome, though, you and your wife in this medical field. You have four kids that they're not just sounds like working at a doctor's office. They are literally doing things to make a difference. Although that job is just as important, I can tell it you. Is. When we it have is. my medical assistants at the office, uh, wow, they, they do Herculean work at getting people in and and getting everything, but yeah, they're 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 kind of doing leadership kind of things, right? Which are, exactly, which that's a I'm, better way yeah. to put it. Yeah, I, I like it. Well, kudos to your kiddos if they listen to this. Yeah. Good job, guys, and keep changing the world. Um, let's get to the final three. Best advice you've ever been given? Oh, um, I think the best advice comes from watching two of my or three of my most favorite people here in town. Actually, they were the best mentors I ever had, and John Forsyth, who I've mentioned, Bruce Van Zee, and Rick Schaefer with a host of other people watching them, like the Glot, Tom Glotty, just watching how they did medicine, how they connected with people, mm-hmm. and people trusted them. Mm-hmm. And building trust uh, is an absolute pivotal part in dealing with, with the, 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 the uncertainties of medicine. Medicine has been described as a science of uncertainty, um, but an art of probability. And, and another fellow once used a quote, which I think uh, the, the, the secret of caring for the patient is to care for the patient. You've got to understand what's behind the person, what the family structure is. You, they have to trust you because it's scary stuff mm-hmm. when, you, when you get sick. You're wondering, is, is this the end, especially in heart? Is, mm-hmm. is this the end of, of my time on earth? And a lot of people have been burned by their, uh, their doctor. So. They have, yeah. yeah. But the... Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate in this community. And I think we have some, some pretty very caring people. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that's a, a, an important part of the equation. It makes a difference. Yeah. Um, if you ever left this place, I don't think you're gonna. Yeah. Uh, what would bring you back here? What would you miss the most? Well, uh, like, uh, I wouldn't leave. I mean, I, I guess probably the only thing that would get me is if all my kids moved and had grandkids in one town. Um, but they're scattered. And mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I'll get on a plane and I'll go see them and I'll do it more <laughs> frequently as I get older. And maybe I'll move up from economy to something with a little more leg room. Uh, that's the thing that I probably keeps me from traveling more. OK, we need to get you more leg room yeah. on the plane. Exit row for sure. Right. Um, and then final meal, final drink. What would that look like? Oh, I have to say my wife makes great lasagna, mm. uh, cinnamon coffee cake. Uh, I love pastry. And these are tastes that I acquired when I was around my grandmother long before I ever knew I was going into medicine. You can't change those. Uh, all the things that I tell you not to eat, I love. And mm-hmm. I'm blessed with being fairly skinny and having <laughs> skinny parents. And <laughs> ma- most people don't have that luxury. Uh, my wife is constantly slapping my hand. And, uh-huh. But she, Good wife. she's now up in Portland. I have to say I went shopping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there's a, yeah, the, the cat's away, right? Yeah, right. right. So. But that will end as soon as she gets back. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a good wife. She's yeah. keeping you in check. Yeah. The time I need to worry is when she tells me to order a double order of pastry. Okay? I love it. Yeah. I love it. Uh, Dr. Brian Gross, you have been so fun. And I mean, this community is very lucky to have you. Well, it's, I'm lucky to have this community. I just love it here. So. Fantastic. Well, I think a lot of people love you. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes and you like it, please subscribe, rate, and review. It helps other people find us. We're also on Google Play, and you can ask your Alexa app to open off script. You can check out the video portion of this podcast at ktvl.com. Just click on features and then off script. Once again, Dr. Brian Gross, if you have a heart attack, someone's going to help you instantly. They will. They will.